so what I want to talk about in, over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is strategies for making an extension when you feel like the top half team has taken all of the best arguments in the round. Marielle, you're late. Oh, you're a lonely child. You're very lonely. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Please come in. Yeah. Um, so, I want to talk about strategy for doing an extension when all the best arguments in the round, or, or when you feel as though all the best arguments in the round have been taken. So this lecture isn't going to be about making an extension in general. It assumes that you already know what an extension is and um, the importance of bringing new or um, important substantive material into the debate in the third speeches on either side. Instead, we're going to talk about those panicky situations that I'm sure you've all encountered when the opening team announces what they're going to say, and you say, that is literally everything we have written down in our paper uh, to say in extension, and what, what are we going to do now? So first, I'm going to talk about strategies and prep time such that this happens to you very rarely. Like that's, that, that's the goal, is that this shouldn't happen to you, so there are things I'm going to talk about uh, in prep time um, to prepare against this. And then the second thing I'll do is I have five suggestions. These are the key five suggestions for how to create an extension out of almost nothing. First though, let's talk about ways to avoid this happening to you. When you are back half teams in preparation time, there are three things you need to think about, and if you think about these three things and prepare arguments, my hope is that this will happen to you very rarely, that you will find yourself in a situation where you feel like you've got nothing new to say in this country. So the first thing to do that I highly recommend is important, and to ask your partner, okay, so when you're on back half, you're kind of lucky, because you don't have to construct your entire speech just before the round begins, right? You've got some time while the other speaker is speaking to actually write out your speech. So you've got a luxury of being able to talk a bit more about what you're going to talk about in the round. So one thing you ought to talk about with your partner is, do we have arguments about all stakeholders in the round? Now what, else, what do I mean by all stakeholders? In any given debate, there are a number of people who are affected by the outcomes of the debate. Right? I'm sorry, not a number of people, a number of types of people who are affected by the outcomes of the debate. Right? So um, in a debate about linking student, a teacher pay to student performance, there are multiple groups who might be affected in that debate. There are students who, who certainly would feel an impact. There are teachers who would certainly feel an impact. And then there's probably broader society as well who benefits or is harmed based on the educational outcomes that students experience. So it's important in prep time to prepare argumentation about all stakeholders in the round. You should have some idea of an argument ready about how this will positively or negatively affect students, how it will positively or negatively affect teachers, and how it will positively or negatively affect broader society, right? So that's one strategy you can use in prep time, is to make sure you have arguments about all stakeholders. It's likely that the opening team oftentimes won't cover one of the stakeholders, and that can be a really excellent uh, avenue for part of your extension, right, to address a particular stakeholder that um, you wouldn't otherwise address. The second suggestion I have for prep time is um, you want to make sure that you and, your you and your partner have arguments prepared about every operative word in the motion. Every operative word in the motion. So, excuse me, what does operative mean? I'm going to explain that. Uh, operative basically means not the words the and 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 because, but the words that are the subjects of the motion. So, for instance, there was once a debate that I was in. And it was, this house believes that South African sports teams should reflect the diversity of, South African, of the South African population, right? So the South African rugby team can't be all white. The South African cricket team can't be all white. It has to have um, a substantial black population on the team. Um, and in that debate, uh, people made arguments about South Africa, and they made arguments about diversity, and why diversity is important. But I don't think anyone made an argument until the second opposition about sports in particular, and why sports are or are not the appropriate avenue for having um, this uh, event. 
And because of that, the second opposition talk about sports are a particularly terrible way of um, increasing diversity in a country and, and, and forcing social change. And they were able to run away with the debate because the other teams had missed the key operative term in the motion. So in prep time on the back half, you and your partner should think, do we have argumentation about all the operative terms in the motion? Do we have an argument about why, um, you know, why are we doing this in South Africa? What is it about South Africa that's unique? We have an argument about why are sports the best avenue? Do we have an argument about these sorts of things, right? Um, you know, uh, or there was a debate at Oxford recently that was this house believes that the African National Congress should nationalize all mines in South Africa, right? There needs to be some discussion about why is the African National Congress the right actor? Why is nationalization the correct approach rather than increasing labor laws or something like this? And why mines? Why not other industries? Right? So this is another thing you can do in prep time. Make sure you've hit all of the operative terms of the motion. And then when the front half teams miss one of those terms, you have an opportunity to fill in. And it's a nice avenue for, for extension. Um, and then the last thing that I would suggest in prep time is making sure you have a gamut of both principled and practical arguments. Right? Principled and practical arguments. So, there's a debate I've been in twice, and I've seen the opposite thing happen both times, um, each time. The debate was, this house believes that the UN should offer bounties for Somali pirates, right? So, you know, if someone were to turn in a Somali pirate, the UN would pay them a bunch of money. It's not especially a current issue, but it was quite current a couple of years ago, and so this was a hotly debated topic, was the Somali pirates thing. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because in the first debate that I was in, the opening half teams, particularly on the government, did a lot of really interesting argumentation. This was a final, this was a semi-final round in a major international competition. So, um, the semi-final teams did quite a good job doing quite a lot of principal material, right? So they talked about why this is within the role and scope of the UN. They talked about why it's important to stop pirates. They talked about why it's appropriate to give money to people who turn people in and charge rent, all this stuff. And then the second government team was able to win the debate because they were like, here are five ways in which this will stop pirates, right? The opening team totally missed the practical aspect of the debate and focused so much on the principal material that they never proved, in fact, that the problem would be solved by the plan they were proposing. The opposite thing happened in the other debate I saw, right? The opening teams did all this material about, and this is where I was first proposition, so I screwed up, um, did all this material about, like, this will stop pirates, right, and it'll make pirates, like, less effective, and they'll be weaker, all these things, but nobody did the material about, like, why is this the sort of thing the UN should do? Why is it morally acceptable to pay people to turn in other people? Like, all these other sorts of things, right? So you want to make sure in prep time you have this gamut of argumentation now, because it can happen in very good debates that teams will miss um, either the principled or practical element of the round, and that will leave you with a really nice um, avenue to go for extension, It'll be a really nice opportunity to make an extension. So those are kind of the three things I think you should do in prep time, which will make it such that typically this won't be an issue for you, I think. I think if you have an argument about all stakeholders, if you have an argument about all the operative words in the motion, and if you make sure you have principled and practical material in your case and after prep time, it's less likely that um, you're going to end up in a situation where you're going to have a hard time extending. It's far less likely. But it can still happen. There are some times that very good front half teams will burn, will do what they call burning the turf, right? They'll just make five or six arguments, and you'll really feel like that's everything we had down. Um, I don't know what we're going to say in extension. We have just gotten the fourth place in this debate, right? This is a feeling that all debaters, I think, have had. Uh, they feel like everything we prepped in prep time is now no longer uh, relevant. So I've got a few suggestions about what to do in this situation, but they all sort of come under one overarching theme, which is that in order for an extension to be successful, in order for a, set, for a third speech in the round to be a successful speech, the speech needs to deliver material such that there is a substantial body of people that 
though unpersuaded by the opening team, would now be persuaded after hearing your speech. So I'll say that that's like your goal in the extension, right? Is that there should be quite a few people who like be very reasonable and listening to the debate who like, although they weren't persuaded by what they heard in the opening, they were like, okay, those are some good ideas, but I'm not sure if I buy that, is now persuaded after hearing your speech. So that's the really important goal that you're getting at every time you're making an extension, even if you have plenty of material, right? The goal of the extension is to make sure that, they, that there are things in your speech that are important to persuade people who wouldn't have been persuaded by the opening team. So what are some ideas for how we can um, do this in a situation where it's like, oh man, I got nothing to say. The first thing to keep in mind, and I think this is really important, people forget this all the time, and it's pretty obvious, new rebuttal can be an extension. New rebuttal can be a very effective extension, it can be a round winning extension. Um, so, but a lot of times people, and I've noticed this particularly with American debaters, but I think it's true with other debaters as well, is we're very pigeonholed into this idea that rebuttal comes at the start of your speech, should only be two and a half minutes, and then you move on to your extension. It's not clear that that's true in all cases, particularly if the majority of positive arguments are made. And you can say, and it's totally legitimate to say, my extension is going to be three reasons why everything the opposition said is wrong. That, and you can go into a lot more depth in rebuttal than you would otherwise. You can go into a lot more substance in rebuttal than you would otherwise. Because I think many people have this view that rebuttal is this thing that comes at the start of my speech, where I briefly respond to the arguments. And I think you probably have noticed this, that you don't have so much time for rebuttal. So many times you're like, there probably is a lot more I could say about that argument, but it's more important that I move on to my uh, positive material and things, right? Um, this uh, is an opportunity, actually, which is very strange, so we're going to call from Utah. Um, this is an opportunity when you t to say, okay, I'm actually going to make rebuttal my extension, and I'm going to respond to whatever the key principle is, and I'm going to have some substantive responses as to why it's not true. I think that's a perfectly legitimate uh, extension avenue, and one to do when you feel like all the positive material you've written on your side of the table has been taken. And you should flag this as your extension. You should be like, my extension is going to be rebuttal. I'm going to beat the opposition teams, or I'm going to beat the proposition teams in my extension. And as a judge, if you go a long way to beating the proposition case, or beating the opposition case, I think that's just as valuable to the debate as contributing new stakeholder analysis or new principles. Right? So I think that's actually something that people often forget about. They're like, I made all these positive arguments and they're taken. Yeah, but there's quite a lot of rebuttal that you can do, that you could probably make a seven-minute speech. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing, and this is what you do when um, you know they start their speech and they're like, my first argument is going to be this. And you're like, okay, well, that's fun. My second argument is going to be this. No, okay. <laughs> you know, third, and they say all the arguments you have, is you need to listen to the front half team's arguments as though you were judging them, right? You need to listen to the front half team's arguments as though you were judging them. And I guarantee you there will be imperfections in their argumentation. I don't know what they will be. It's entirely plausible that they will make an assertion that is not proven by an example. It is possible that they have underemphasized a particularly important part of the link story. They've underemphasized, that's fine. They've underemphasized a particularly important part of the argument that leads to the conclusion. It's possible that they didn't impact their arguments fully, right? Like they made an argument, but they didn't explain why it was important in society, or didn't do that fully, right? And so if, as you listen to your, their arguments like a judge, you can notice what these things that are missing, and then you can take the opportunity in extension to fill them in. And I think this is a really good strategy. Right? You can say, look, what I'm going to do for you in extension, Mr. and Madam Speaker, is I'm going to take, I think that the opening team brought us really good analysis, but I think that some of it is, has not been totally proven just yet, and I'm going to fill in the gaps that will prove that these arguments are true, right? So I'm going to provide examples for, um, you know, this argument and prove that this exists in reality. I'm going to explain more why this concept is important in society, right? But the only way that you'll notice these things is if you listen for them, right? 
if you just look at the tags of the arguments, you're going to think that the other team has taken all of your material. It's very important to listen to the content of the argument and um, make sure you, uh, you notice what's missing and then you can capitalize that in an extension. When you take this strategy, I think it's really important to explain to the judge, maybe in the extension speech, maybe in the whip speech, depending on the situation, it's really important to explain to the judge why this material you're adding is key to the argument being persuasive. Right? So I think what you say is something like, look, the opening proposition presented a shell of this argument. My partner and I brought you the key piece of analysis that proves that it's true, which is that, you know, whatever, it affects people in this particular way, or, or here's an, this example that really changed the round. Right? So it's not enough just to fill in what's missing, but you need to demonstrate to the judge that without this element that was missing, that you so helpfully added, that the argument would not have been complete, not be persuasive. Remember, what you're trying to do is contribute something to the round such that although people were not persuaded by opening, they're now persuaded by you. So that's a second piece of advice that I have. That I have. A third piece of advice that I think, a third strategy you could take is, um, decide, is what you do is you ground the debate in reality, right? So it might be the case that the opening proposition or the opening opposition has made all of the key arguments, right? Um, and then what you say is you say, look, what I'm going to do in extension is I'm going to give you three case studies of where this would be true, right? And I'm going to give you three pieces of, of, of like uh, examples and, and analysis of where this would be true. I've done this in extension before, right? Um, there was a debate that I thought was a particularly shallow debate um, at Worlds last year. And it was, this house would not allow defamation charges in academic disputes, right? So what happens at the moment in academic disputes is that someone can, like, make an argument in the literature, and then someone else can be like, that argument's really dumb. And then someone can sue them for defamation and be like, you're ruining my career by challenging my argument, such that academic argument is, like, stymied and it's not really as good as it could be otherwise, right? And it seems like that's kind of all the argumentation there is on problem. Um, an opening proposition made all this argumentation very well. They're talking about all the ways in which, um, uh, you know, argument should be signed. And I was like, okay, in extension, I'm just going to give you three scenarios in which this could potentially happen and explain why they would be bad, right? And this is an avenue of extension. You're not contributing anything argumentatively new, but what you're doing is grounding the debate in reality and painting a picture that the judge can understand. And then, in the whip speech, my partner was like, look, you know, Mary Ellen knows who my partner is, uh, was like, look, uh, the opening team gave us all the theoretical material, what my partner did is grounded the case in reality and explained how this actually works in the real world, such that, um, you know, you better understand it. We got the one in the debate, so that was cool. Um, so you can do that. It's effective. It's, it can be effective. Uh, you could say, look, even though all the arguments have been made, and they can be real case studies, or they can even be hypothetical case studies. You'd be like, if this were to happen, it would be very bad. Even if the opening team made a broad argument about it, you can fill it in with a, with a particular um, case study or set of case studies. Okay, so that's the third suggestion for what to do in a case where um, you feel like all the material has been taken. The fourth suggestion is you can do a comparison of the debate. This is something that uh, I think is really valuable and should be in your extension speech anyway but you can kind of make it your entire extension speech, right? So if after the front half, the proposition teams have presented some benefits and the opposition teams have presented some harms, right, to the policy. And the proposition teams like, if we do the policy, things X, Y, and Z will happen that are good. Um, and the opposition's like, if we do the policy, things A, B, and C will happen that are bad, right? That's likely that happened in the debate. What you can do as a closing team, if you're like, there really are no more arguments, is you can go through and be like, I'm going to show you why the benefits we've brought you on side proposition so far outweigh the harms brought you on but that side opposition brought you, or vice versa. And then you can go through each one. You can be like, we told you that this is going to improve the economy. Let me tell you about the six groups of people that affects and why they're more important than the environment that's going to be harmed on their side house, or whatever. You know, do you, you, you see what I'm saying? You can 
create a comparison of the round. And you can make your extension, rather than a new argument, a comparative weighing of the various issues that have been presented in the round thus far. And I think this can be an effective way to differentiate yourself from the opening teams. And you can say, you know, what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, is we're demonstrating to you why the arguments brought on the proposition are the most valuable ones in the round, and explain why um, they're important. Okay. So that's uh, the fourth suggestion. If none of these work, there's the fifth suggestion. Actually, there are six suggestions, because I have to eat it all as fifth suggestion. But if this is if the first four don't work, you do what I call grasping at straws, which is you make as many little arguments as possible and hope that their amalgamation will amount to something valuable. You know what I mean? So you just, you literally are like, let me, if you, if like, I don't ever think you're really going to get to this point. Like, I think one of these four things will help you. But in as far as you do get here, what you can do is be like, oh, there's this small group over here that they didn't think about. And there's this, like, minor economic impact they didn't think about. And there's this impact on the development of science that they didn't think about. And there's this principled case that they didn't. And you just try to do, like, quite a lot of these things and hope that their amalgamation amounts to something um, quite quite strong. So that's sort of like the fifth idea. I hope you don't ever end up there. Anytime you do any of these, the whip speech becomes vastly more important than it was before. Because it's not going to be obvious to the judge in extension that you have in fact created an extension in the debate. If you make a totally new argument or substantially improve tons of proposition of, of opening team arguments such that you're clearly more persuasive to them, it will be obvious to the judge that you have extended the debate, and the whip speaker has less of a job to do in convincing the judge that you've presented something new in the round. However, when you do one of these strategies, because the major arguments are taken, and you have a hard time extending the debate, it becomes very important for the whip speaker to effectively persuade the judge that, uh, in fact, you've presented an extension. So there are a number of ways to do this effectively. The first of which, and I think you should do this probably in all whip speeches, but it's especially important, is to say at the end of your whip speech, this is the material that my partner brought you that won the debate, and explain what it is and why it's the most important to you on the ground. I think it's totally fine to say that very expression, right? My partner brought you these two arguments, and here's why those arguments win the debate because they show how the greatest number of people are impacted and because they show the extent to which, you know, these impacts affect people for the rest of their lives, or whatever, you know. Um, you say, here is the material my partner brought you when you want to do that. You want to put that at the end of your whip speech, right? You're like, here's why we went today. Throughout your whip speech, you're going to be explaining arguments, right, that happened in the round. You're going to be explaining what happened in the round, that's what a whip speech is. Every time, you explain a top half team argument. This is like James Hardy's favorite phrase as well. You want to use the phrase, what we add is. What we add is, right? So you will say, the opening team made this very clever argument about how, in principle, it's totally legitimate to extract wealth from mines run by slaves. I don't know. Like, people make these crazy arguments, right? And you say, what we add is, an analysis of how that functions in the South African context, right? Like, you can, you can you, you explain exactly what it is that you add to each argument. And that way, at the end of your speech, it will seem as though you've presented quite a lot of material um, that's new and novel in the round. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can flag the major clashes at, uh, uh, as things that your partner said, as ways that your partner said those arguments. So for instance, it's possible that your partner may have made some of the same arguments uh, as the opening team, but might have said them somewhat differently. When you're flagging them in your whip speech, you want to make sure you say them in the way your partner did, rather than in the way they were said by the opening team. Thus reminding the judge that your partner, um, you know, brought this new argument into the round. The last suggestion I have about whip speeches is that you want to say your partner's name or my partner several times in the whip speech. Because you want to be like, the key analysis that my partner brought you is this. 
The key analysis that my partner brought you is this, right? You want to keep reminding everyone that this analysis came from the closing team, not from the opening team, right? That's your key goal, is to convince the judge that it's because of your team's analysis that they were persuaded, not because of the opening team's analysis. Okay. Now, this is my, if all else fails, um, suggestion, right? It's possible that despite your best efforts and things, you will really feel as though there is no avenue. None of these five suggestions will work for you. Um, there is no avenue to go in extension. Here's what you do then. You make the arguments again, and you try to make them with more flair. Right? You try to make them, you try to say them more persuasively, you try to make use more attention getting devices, you try to use more exciting rhetoric, these sorts of things. I this is a last resort type option and the smart judge will notice it. But you know, in as far as you end up in a situation where none of these plans work, I think that's certainly better than not saying anything, right? And a lot of times you can walk away with a two or a three by tucking behind a really good uh, first team. They're like, well, you said the same things they did, but those arguments still beat the opposition, or still beat the proposition. So you can still end up doing okay in the round. All right, let's, let me uh, just like summarize what I've gone over, because I think it was a lot of information. Um, and then we'll take questions, and then we'll go on to the next uh, elected things. So, first of all, there are ways in prep time to avoid this happening, right? We agreed on this. There are ways in prep time to what's happening. The first way is to make sure that you have arguments about all stakeholders in the round, right? You want to make sure that all stakeholders, anyone who might be affected by the policy, has an argument about them, why they matter, how they're affected, the extent to which they're affected. That should happen in prep time. The second thing you have in prep time is you want to make sure you hit all operative words in the motion, right? We talked about this. This is something that very good debate teams often forget to do, right? They will just totally miss an area of, of the motion. Because you get wrapped up in proving some other part and you end up missing an area. By making sure in prep time you have an argument of all operative words in the motion, there's a good way to go. And then, always a good way to go in extension. And then the last thing you want to do is um, make sure you have both principled and practical material prepared uh, in, in the event that either team misses, the opening team misses one or the other. Like I said, um, it's exciting to be in prep time, to be on the closing half, because you're lucky uh, in as far as you don't need to construct your complete speech. Whereas if you're on the front half, particularly one of the first speakers, often you need to have the whole speech written out before you go into the round. You don't really need to do that, so you have lots more time in prep time to talk about these issues. Um, prep time is very, very important to avoiding this happening. In as far as it does happen, though, we went over five things, right? Now let's go over them just quickly, and then uh, I can take questions. Um, the first one is that new rebuttal can be an extension. I think this is probably the most important one, right? Like, people all the time forget this. That it's totally okay to say, my extension is just proof that the other side is wrong. It's nothing positive. It's merely showing for four separate reasons with lots of detail why the other side is wrong. You need to listen to the arguments of the other teams as if you were a judge. Find out what's missing and fill in those gaps and then remind the judge that uh, you filled in those gaps and why those gaps are the key gaps to understanding the arguments, right? You need to do some meta debate in these instances. You'd be like, Mr. Speaker, like, we brought you this key analysis. You wouldn't have bought the argument before, but now you do, right? You can do case studies and ground the case in reality, right? We talked about this, where you can create examples of how this has happened or might happen in the real world, right? And that can help the judge to understand what, you're talk what the arguments of the opening team are. You can do a comparison of the impacts in the round. Your whole speech can be comparative. And then last but not least, you try to do lots of little arguments and have them build up. That actually is these. Okay, that's the end of my plan chat. Uh, what questions do you have?